So today's speaker, let me introduce Ali. So Ali is an urban planner with Public Health Nova Scotia Health Authority. Her work there has focused on building partnerships with municipal planners and engineers to embed a public health lens in a municipal plan in municipal plans and policies. Some of her research, some of her recent projects um, include supporting the development of the integrated mobility plan for Halifax, leading public health's first health impact assessment and co-creating Halifax's first mobile food market. And her prior work has focused on developing comprehensive community-based plans with First Nations communities across Canada. She has a bachelor in recreation management in recreation management from Acadia University and a master's in, environment, in environmental studies from York University. Uh, welcome, Ali. I turn the mic over to you. Okay. Um... Thanks, Emily, and uh, thank you to CPHA for hosting this webinar series and inviting me to be a part of it. Um, I'm happy to be here to share a little bit about the work that I'm involved with, with a, with a team of people here at Public Health um, in, in Halifax, Nova Scotia. <clears throat> I have a bit of a cough today, so hopefully I will not... Um, I, I won't cough too much throughout the presentation. Um, I do have a, a, a bit of an outline. I thought that I would start with um, an introduction, very quick introduction to the Nova Scotia Health Authority um, and sort of where I sit within, within that large health authority. And then I'll, I'll speak a bit about urban planning and public health. And then I'll, I'll, I'll finish with just a few case studies of some recent work um, one is a health impact assessment, a rapid health impact assessment that we did on a municipal planning strategy that the Halifax municipality had released about a year ago. And then the other case study is, um, as Emily mentioned in, in my bio, the working on the development of the integrated mobility plan with, with Halifax, which is really just a transportation plan um, for the municipality. And, and then I hope that uh, we can have a discussion um, uh, at the end. <clears throat> so before we get going, and um, I have I have a couple questions just to sort of gauge gauge uh, who's in the audience. Um, I, I know I've I've never done this poll. Oh, there it is. Oh, thanks, Emily. <clears throat> I'm wondering um, if you could fill out this poll and uh, whether you've participated in the development of, of a municipal plan or policy before. Okay. Are people still voting? Okay. So, so, uh, Okay, the poll is closed. Okay, so the um, you know the majority of people have have not, but although some some in the audience have have, which is great. Um, and so, sort of building on that, the next question I have is just around um, sort of considering uh, what do you consider your your level of knowledge about about urban planning or community planning? Is it advanced, intermediate, or or do you is it a, a beginner? Okay. Great. Okay. <clears throat> so a similar result. So um, uh, to the previous question. So sort of the majority of people who have tuned in um, have not attended a planning uh, meeting and considered themselves to be sort of beginners in, in in the area, which is not too surprising. Most most of the time when I'm speaking to uh, a health uh, audience, um, that's, that's often the case, although it, it is shifting um, and more and more health people are, are engaging in, in municipal planning work. So thanks, thanks for participating. 
<clears throat> okay, so uh, we'll just get into the presentation. Um, so, so I'm I, I work with the Nova Scotia Health Authority. I work with um, with public health within the health authority. The the NSHA, or an acronym, um, was formed just two years ago in April 2015, and it brought together nine different regional health authorities in our in our province um, into one, and then was divided into four zones. So. Um, for public health, it's allowed us to share our approaches, our strategies, and our tools across zones more easily, um, since we're, we're all part of the same health authority. And it's helping us apply a more consistent approach to, to our work. Um, and all of us within the health authority, um, not only public health, but every, everyone within the health authority is working towards our vision of healthy people, healthy communities for generations. So. Um, uh, as I mentioned, I, I work within public health. I'm within the central zone um, of the health authority. And so within central zone, we support three municipal units, um, including the Halifax Regional Municipality, which is the province's largest municipality. It covers a really huge land area, um, just about the size of Prince Edward Island. Um, the Halifax Regional Municipality is home to uh, close to half the, the province's population, just, uh, just over 426 people live in, in the municipality. And uh, the Halifax Regional Municipality is the generator of a, just over 60% of the province's GDP. So um, <clears throat> we, serve, we serve a very urban population and also a very rural, um, given, given the scope of, of the land area that we serve. Um, and so I, I'm focusing on Halifax Regional Municipality because the rest of the presentation and the work that I'll be presenting really is about our partnership specifically with the Halifax Municipality. Um, so I joined Public Health in March 2013. Um, oops, there we go. Um, <clears throat> And, uh, and but given, given that this is a CPHA webinar, I imagine that most people who have tuned in have an understanding of, of the work of public health. But here in Nova Scotia, this is sort of how, how we describe our, our work. Um, so I'll, I'll, keep, I'll keep this overview pretty brief. So we work with others to understand the health uh, um, of our communities, and we act together to in, improve health. Often public health is known through our work that uh, the public health nurses do delivering immunization programs, working with pre and postnatal women and babies and their families, or responding to outbreaks like mumps, measles, or H1N1. <clears throat> but the area of public health I work in also focuses on chronic and communicable disease prevention. However, we approach the work slightly different than, than our, our, um, our colleagues in health protection in the early years. Um, areas. We work, um, I work in healthy communities and our work really is focused on creating supportive environments and healthy public policy. So we work to improve the health of our population and reduce health inequities through taking action on the social determinants of health and health equity. We support the creation of healthy environments through understanding local circumstances and data, partnership development, and working to bring a health lens to policies at a variety of levels. So when I first joined in, in 2013, I had uh, I was very fortunate to be able to work with an incredible medical officer of health, um, Dr. Gaynor Watson Creed, uh, <clears throat> and to help me orient um, my, to uh, public health, the work of public health, Gaynor showed me this slide, um, and it was it was very helpful for me to understand where the work of public health sort of sits within within the health authority. Um, <clears throat> and so you can see that a large part of the work of the health authority sits within primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention, and it's our sort of acute st care structures or services. Um, but Gaynor really pointed out to me that the work of public health is much more upstream. It's, it's a work that's described as primordial prevention. We have to work on preventing the risk factors from e of disease um, from even occurring. And so this requires us to work with, um, with school boards on healthy eating policies so that we create supportive eating environments um, for children <clears throat> and youth. 
It requires us to work with municipalities, their transportation departments, to work on road safety and transportation plans to encourage physical activity and reduce uh, injuries or the severity of injuries and fatalities on our streets. So we need to do this upstream work with a lot of partners. And it, uh, so when Gaynor showed me this diagram, it, it helped me understand why public health was interested in engaging in with uh, uh, having an urban planner on staff and also engaging with our municipal colleagues. <clears throat> so we understand that um, communities, uh, where we live, the neighborhoods we live in or the communities we live in really has an impact on population health. It's the reason why my public health um, unit has been working so hard over the last four years, specifically um, focusing in on urban planning uh, policies at the municipal level. So we understand through a group from MIT, that, uh, a report they released in 2014, that communities that are designed for physical activity have significant health um, impacts. So this group reports that um, you know we could decrease heart many chronic conditions like heart disease, strokes, site-specific cancers considerably if we just designed our communities with a health lens and we could reduce some um, type 2 diabetes um, by an incredible amount. <clears throat> And so, and so, as I mentioned, we've been we've been working with our municipal colleagues um, to embed a health lens um, and to design our communities to promote not only physical activity but to reduce injuries, promote food security, um, promote affordable housing, etc. Um, <clears throat> and so, a little bit about about um, about urban planning. Uh, the planning um, planners develop and implement policies that influence the places we live, work, play on a day-to-day -day basis. They, so they inform our public and community spaces and places like our parks and our waterfronts. They inform the type and the form and the location of our housing, of our commercial buildings, our recreation facilities. And planners also influence and determine our transportation networks and systems, such as our transit systems, our streets, our roads, our active transportation infrastructure, like bike lanes and sidewalks and trails. <clears throat> they do this through a variety of planning documents. So this slide, um, I saw a few years ago, Dr. David Mowat present this slide on the Ontario context, and I've just read, I've adapted it for the Nova Scotia context. But this, this really shows all the planning documents. This is land use focused planning documents that are out there. Um, and so all of these documents really influence the, the communities and the neighborhoods we live in. <clears throat> And what Dr. David Mowat saw in this diagram is that there's an opportunity at a variety of le levels to influence planning policy um, and to bring a health lens to planning policy. So at the very macro level, we can start to embed health considerations or a health lens in provincial acts like the Municipal Government Act. Or at a very micro level, we can start to think about how a particular site plan of an individual development might better promote um, health. And so over the last few years, um, the, the team that I work with here at Public Health has engaged in a variety of, of, these, of these different levels or scales of plans. So um, we've engaged with the regional municipal planning strategy, a, a secondary municipal planning strategy, some priority plans um, uh, with, uh, with our colleagues within Halifax Municipality. So Dr. Jill Grant um, is a professor at, at Dalhousie um, here in Halifax in the School of Planning. And she released uh, or she published an article in, um, in, in a planning magazine in 2014 that shows that there are a lot of plans. <laughs> there are all sorts of different plans um, that municipalities have from land use plans, active transportation plans, environment plans, open space, heritage, growth, etc. And so it's no wonder that people can get overwhelmed 
um, by the amount of planning that's happening um, and get kind of confused about how these plans interact or connect um, and, how, and, and also have the time to engage in the, in, and bring a health lens to the variety of plans that are, that are open <clears throat> for comments. Um, and so I've been fortunate to work with, uh, with a, a, an advisory committee that includes senior leaders from public health and the municipality to help guide the work that I and other staff members uh, are sort of undertake. And so we know that there are so many plans and policies that influence public health, um, but we don't necessarily, but we need to be strategic because we don't necessarily have um, endless amounts of resources to engage in all, all varieties of, of plans. So this, this advisory committee has helped guide um, <clears throat> and influence the work that we've been doing here. So, <clears throat> as I mentioned, we have this advisory committee who's been guiding and leading and overseeing the partnership. Um, and we've been able to engage in municipal plans in a variety of ways. So I've attended public meetings. I've, I've requested that I be part of a of stakeholder meetings that the municipality hosts on a variety of their plans. I've had the opportunity to present to municipal staff and council and some of their advisory committees on things like the municipal role in the food system or um, some of the findings um, from uh, an active transportation indicators report that we are we are under under uh, that's under development right now um, I've written letters that summarize our, our opinions our public health comments on on the plans and sent them to staff and councils and and they've become part of the public record so I've been able to as as an urban planner, I engage in a number of different plans in a bunch of different ways. And so over the last four years, we've really been using this time to sort of learn and adapt um, how, how we bring a health lens to, to municipal plans. So I, I want to dive into <clears throat> briefly just two examples of of the work that um, I've been a part of. Um, the first one, as I mentioned, is this rapid health impact assessment that um, I and some, a few other colleagues here at Public Health developed. And then um, I want to speak about uh, participating on the municipal staff team of, uh, of developing the transportation plan. So the, the center plan is a new municipal planning strategy for the urban area of our region. So it consolidates four old plans that were developed in the 70s and, and updates them. It was released in 2017. Um, for, a draft was released in 2017. Um, and, uh, and the municipality allowed for five weeks of public comments and feedback. So we decided here at Public Health that we would we would undertake a rapid health impact assessment with two main purposes. One, we wanted to inform decision makers of the potential for the center plan to create healthy communities and to decrease health disparities. We wanted to um, emphasize um, the ability of the plan to prevent chronic disease, support mental wellness, and improve quality of life for all residents of our region. And then the second purpose of, of conducting this, this rapid health impact assessment was to provide recommendations on how to increase the health promoting potential of the new plan and mitigate any, un, any unanticipated negative health consequences based on the evidence found in relevant literature and expert opinion. <clears throat> So we followed, um, you know, a typical health impact assessment process, um, which is outlined there, steps one to four. Sometimes there, there are five steps, um, <clears throat> which breaks apart assessing and reporting. Um, and and, uh, and we, we were fortunate to be able to use a number of existing tools uh, to help us because, we, like, as I mentioned, we only had five weeks, so we had to be kind of quick quick about our process and quick about our, our literature review and, and summary. And so <clears throat> um, on the slide here, you can see that we drew heavily from the National Collaborating Center for Healthy Public Policy. We used a lot of their health impact assessment tools. 
The, the document on the left there is um, the Healthy Built Environment Linkages Toolkit from the Provincial Health Services Authority in British Columbia. Um, that really helped us frame out some principles and, and our scope. And we also uh, drew heavily from a health impact assessment uh, on transportation and land use planning initiatives developed by Metro, Metro Vancouver. So if you are interested in engaging in um, a you know, health impact assessment on some municipal plans, uh, these, these three, those two documents are, are fantastic and the National Collaborating Centre for Healthy Public Policy has a, an abundance of resources and tools that could help. So as I mentioned, the Healthy Built Environment Linkages Toolkit helped us inform our areas of focus for, oops, that's too far. Helped us inform our areas of focus for the health impact assessment. Um, <clears throat> I had also attended a number of the public meetings, so understood what was bubbling up for community members, what were the main um, issues that they were seeing within the plan, and so that also helped us form our scope. So we chose to look at sustainability. So, you know, figuring out how does this plan connect to climate change, air quality, extreme weather events. Um, we looked at housing. Um, we looked at whether the policies within, within the plan really supported um, a mix of types and tenures of housing, whether it, uh, whether it supported affordable housing um, and, and health equity. We looked at mobility to see if policies supported transit use or active transportation, whether the policies supported physical activity or injury prevention. And we looked at the food systems. <clears throat> uh, we looked at the report, the plan through a food systems lens. So um, does the, we were looking for whether the plan called for policies that would support local healthy food retail, local food production like community gardens and urban agriculture. So those were our areas of focus, and as I mentioned earlier, we were looking to see whether the plan really did um, promote chronic disease prevention, mental wellness, and quality of life. <clears throat> so the, the plan has not yet been approved by council, but um, I just have three bullets here that show just three examples of of the impact that I think that the health that our, our health impact assessment report had on changing some of the policies. So, uh, for example, there's a an addition of an equity analysis um, within the, the latest draft of the center plan. So, this this will require municipal staff to go through some sort of equity analysis um, when they're making infrastructure decisions. There are some new policies around air quality, sort of buffer, including buffers between highways and, and high density residential areas that will help with local um, air quality. And then there are some supportive new po policies that support food systems around, um, you know, around uh, allowing <clears throat> a variety of different food uses in, in a variety of different, different uh, zone types. And so we were, the health impact assessment was really successful in, in informing um, and including some, some new health sort of focused policies within, within the document, but almost more importantly, it's also had such a, a great impact, positive impact on our public health practice. So it's demonstrated the value of collaborating across disciplines. It's highlighted a clear and a really significant role that public health professionals can play into in informing and analyzing health impacts of municipal plans. And it's increased awareness among our municipal colleagues and, and council um, about the role of public health and of our shared interests and values. And as a result of submitting this uh, health impact assessment, we've been asked um, to conduct other HIAs on a variety of different topics. Okay, <clears throat> so the second case study I wanted to chat about quickly is um, the development of an integrated mobility plan for Halifax, which again is really just a transportation plan. And I think this is an interesting project because I was able to join the staff team from, from day one. So instead of responding to a draft plan like the center plan, the, the staff team developed it and, and I got to read it and, and reply. This plan I was able to, to work on the team from the very beginning. 
And so I was able to embed a health lens or a health perspective um, at all steps and stages uh, of the plan. And so I was able to also build relationships with, with a number of new municipal staff um, members within, within different departments, so within planning and development, within Halifax Transit, and uh, Transportation Public Works. And this, <clears throat> I'm just going to go back to that. And this might, for those of you in Ontario, this might not necessarily seem as um, as significant as because public health is embedded in the municipal system. But here in Nova, Nova Scotia, we are outside the municipal system. So this was a, a first for us um, to be uh, embedded in in the staff team from from the very beginning. And so at the outset, we decided as a team that we needed to frame some of the outcomes that we were hoping to achieve in the plan. And you can see that healthy, although I think all four pillars of the plan sort of speak to health outcomes, but you can see that healthy is one of the core, core pillars of, of the plan. And so I was able to sort of further articulate what we meant by that pillar um, and, and make sure that we engaged the public um, on these four pillars and and, ar and around uh, how we are how were we to develop a healthy transportation network and system. <clears throat> I just wanted to throw this slide in here just to show you that the overarching goal of the of the plan really will promote population health around physical activity um, has potential to. Uh, so the goal of the plan is to decrease the number of people driving and increase the number of people taking transit and active transportation. So if we can do that, if the plan is successful, we will have more people embedding physical activity in their daily routines and their daily lives, which, as I mentioned earlier, has, has great impact on a number of um, uh, chronic conditions. <clears throat> so I think it's interesting to note that um, that not, I, I not only brought a public health lens around physical activity or injury prevention or health equity accessibility, but I also brought a lot of public health core competencies that were really needed and significant, I think, to um, significant contributions to the team. So as public health professionals, um, the uh, Public Health Agency of Canada really outlines a lot of our core competencies around community engagement, diversity, and inclusiveness. So I was able to bring that lens to the team um, and bring new partners into the conversation. Our core competencies talk about you know, policy development, partnership development, um, and evaluation and monitoring. So I supported the development of a logic model and, and, evalu and a draft evaluation framework. So I brought my urban planning perspective, but I also brought a lot of public health competen competencies that were, that were really needed to the team. Um, and so uh, this plan has, like the center plan, has not yet been approved, but we'll be going to municipal council in December. And we were thrilled that we were, that our medical officer of health um, has been invited to co-present with the other municipal directors from planning and development, transportation and transit um, to municipal council. <clears throat> so it will be all four, four organizations and, and departments represented um, at the table. <clears throat> so just to close, I hope this presentation has given you a bit of a taste of the work that an urban planner does with a public health focus. Um, I hope that it's highlighted the important role and contribution that public pu health professionals can play in developing healthy communities. Um, and in my experience, our municipal decision makers, our policy developers, our municipal colleagues need and want public health support, and they want our public health perspective on their plans and policies. It's pretty clear over the last four years, working closely with them, that we share a number of core values and interests, such as you know, creating vibrant and equitable communities, um, sustainable development, reducing social isolation, increasing social cohesion, reducing injuries, and the list goes on. Um, so I guess I recommend um, that you try to reach out to a municipal planner and offer your support or, um, you know, look up the next municipal uh, planning meeting in your, in your area and, and attend and get involved and bring that public health perspective to a local plan. 
Um, there are many loud voices already engaged and involved in the policy development process um, that don't necessarily have the public interest or public good at heart. And so I think as public health uh, professionals, it's our responsibility to lend our voice to the conversation um, to ensure that we, we support the creation of healthy communities and, and healthy people. Um, and so for those of you who haven't seen it, uh, the Chief Public Health Officer of Canada released a report at the end of October that, um, that talks about the importance of designing healthy living. Um, and it talks about food, it talks about mental health, and it talks about transportation and, and, and um, you know, broadly the, the importance of the built environment. And so um, I, would, I would urge you, if you're interested in this topic, to check out this report because it does a great um, job at summarizing the evidence and, and um, articulating a, a call to action. Thank you. Thanks, Sally. That was great. Uh, it really gave me, at least, a, a good idea of what a, um, a public or um, an urban planner in public health does. And I really enjoyed the case studies, especially. Um, if anyone has questions, I invite you to post them in the chat box, and uh, we'll chat with Ali to uh, answer your questions. We have one from Alia. So I'll give you a few minutes to type. So Alia is asking, have you encountered resistance to a public health perspective in your work? And if so, where does it come from? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, cer certainly. Um, and I think, um, I think at the, at the beginning of developing our partnership with municipal colleagues, uh, there, it, there was some trepidation, there was some resistance. Um, and so we were careful in the approach that we took um, to, to building a partnership and to build uh, trusting relationships. And so um, we, we went in, um, our, our sort of vision was to embed public health considerations in municipal plans and policies. But we knew in order to achieve that, we had to really be very supportive um, sort of offer support, our support and encouragement um, to our municipal colleagues. And so, um, and we also, in order to do that <laughs> successfully, we had to be okay with taking some baby steps. So are the plans that I've been involved in perfect? Um, would, no, but I think that they are a step in the right direction towards creating healthier communities. Um, and I, I don't necessarily know where the where the resistance comes from. I would I would guess sort of like as I said in my closing, there's a there are a lot of competing interests um, uh, being being voiced and being thrown at the municipal arena right now. Um, sort of private interest within develop the development industry, um, uh, the heritage advocates here. Um, public health advocates. So I think it's just a variety of competing interests and in, in trying to figure out a way to balance all those interests um, is the job of a planner and, and keep the public good in, at, the, at the center of, of it all is the job of a planner. But um, I think maybe that's where some of the resistance comes from. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if that entirely answers it, your question. <clears throat> Great. From Alia. Oh, we have another one from Chase. In the meantime, I was wondering if you had any advice for someone who's looking to go into urban planning as a career. Um, are there university programs or other educational programs that you would recommend? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. There are. Um, <clears throat> really depends on on your your interest or your focus in urban planning. You can. Um, there, are, there are more design-based programs that you can go to, so that would probably be the McGill's, um, the McGill University or Dalhousie is, is more of a design-based um, 
uh, program or there are more policy-based programs that, such as uh, Guelph, I would, I would say, is more policy-based and, and York. Um, but there are planning, planning programs, yeah, ac across, across the country and I'd be happy, if anyone is interested, I'd be happy to, to talk to them um, about what I know about each of the programs. So from Chase, does the health authority have a particular consultation pro or particular consultation processes in place for First Nations communities? For example, traditional knowledge considerations. Right. Um, I, I I don't know of any that are specific to First Nation communities. We do have the health authority has identified priority populations. Um, so First Nations communities uh, being one, um, persons with disabilities, African Nova Scotians, and, uh, and newcomers. So those are our four priority populations. And so there are targeted um, uh, approaches to engaging those priority populations. And there are specific staff, um, <clears throat> uh, staff members whose, whose role is to, to ensure that, that those populations are engaged in health conversations, um, are also engaged uh, as employees of, of the health authority. So I'm not familiar with any that are specific only to First Nations, but just more broadly around, um, around diversity and inclusion and, and health equity. We have, the health authority does have a, a health equity lens that was developed. Um, that is is being implemented across across the board in, in different ways um, that help staff in different departments bring bring a health equity lens to healthcare decisions and programs. I, I'm also happy to share that health lens health equity lens if you're interested. That would be great. Great, Chase says. Maybe um, since there's interest, you can go in a bit more detail around that health lens. Oh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> pardon me. I'm putting you on the spot, so if that's too big a question. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I don't have it in front of me, but it's, it's a. Um, it's it's very similar to a, a health impact assessment. You know, it's it takes you through a variety of you know four steps. And on, um, on program and decision development, and it it asks you key questions um, that help you ensure that health equity is considered at all stages of of your decision making. Okay, so um, it it asks you, you know, what are the priority populations? Yeah. Who's not? Sh you know, it requires you to think about who's not showing up, or how do you engage certain people? Um, so it, it goes into four steps and it, it offers some guiding questions to ensure that health equity is being considered at all steps. So for instance, yeah, no, no, it's, it's fine. Yeah, it's fine. I mean, I haven't, I have a, we've used, we've used it, not necessarily the four steps um, per se, but a health equity lens in the development of the mobile food market. Um, so public health was involved in developing or identifying the priority communities that would benefit most from increasing um, access to affordable healthy foods. And so we used some population health data and, and, um, and, and identified the communities and then thanks, used, thanks um, you uh, know, engaging approaches to Catherine. engaging some so of the stakeholders and the community members in those to, priority um, communities to help us to inform the, the mobile food market. So your, your um, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a guideline that helps you consider it that, that can be uh, adapted to whatever decision or project you're working on. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so <clears throat> the, the Healthy Built Environment Linkages Toolkit 
was uh, was very helpful for us because it outlines sort of the logic um, be behind you know if you increase access to transit or transportation um, then you more people will walk or bike and then if you have more people walking and biking then um, the evidence shows that um, increased physical activity decreased injuries and then the evidence shows a link to chronic disease prevention so that healthy built environment linkages toolkit was was very helpful for us given the fact that we only had five weeks to do uh, an analysis and a consolidation um, of, of our findings into, into a, an accessible report, um, we, we drew heavily on, on so the evidence summaries and the links that that, 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 that document has, uh, had. We also like have <clears throat> really great library resources here at the Health Authority, and so we were able to draw on those, those library resources and those librarians to support the process. Tight as Salima's typing. So how can uh, an MPH student transition into planning roles? Do mm. you believe a formal planning education is needed? Mm. Um, so, yeah, to be, um, to become, um, so I'm, there, we have a professional organization, the Canadian Institute for Planners, um, and so I am a, a full, um, you know, member of, of, of CIP, and um, it really depends on the planning job, but most planning jobs do require uh, either membership or eligibility to become a member of the Canadian Institute for Planners, um, but, and you, and it, there are, I, although I'm a little out of touch with um, the process, because I think it's changed since I went through it, but uh, if you don't have a planning degree, you can log your hours under a professional planner, and, and it just will take you longer. I think it might take you six years of logging planning experience. Um, if you have an undergraduate, I think it takes you four years, and if you have a master's in planning, then I think it takes you two years. Um, so there are ways um, that you can become a, a professional planner. Uh, it just will take you, without a degree, but it will take you longer. Um, I think uh, that working within a public health unit on the built environment or on the municipal file is a, a really, would be a really good way for a master's Thanks. of public health um, student to get engaged in, in, in municipal planning work and to, to sort of uh, gain that sort of breadth of, of experience. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah, I, I think that health promoters have a lot to contribute um, to the built environment and to planning and policy conversations. Um, so I don't think you necessarily have to be an urban planner to to we'll write take, planning policy. Uh, I think we I all, I think a variety of disciplines, Alia, um, that right. social we'll workers and health promoters, and nutritionists and, and anthropologists um, all need to be involved in, in policy, the developing municipal planning policy. We'll hang tight as uh being entered in the box.
So from uh, Salima, so is climate change and the impact on health being addressed in municipal public planning? Or at least in your experience in Halifax. <coughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah, in Halifax, I mean, we have um, the, we have, in Nova Scotia, um, and many municipalities have climate change adaptation plans, and they also have integrated community sustainability plans, which, which talks about plant uh, climate change. Um, and so, so yeah, there uh, there are so plans on that, note, um, that, um, we that speak will conclude. So thanks again, uh, to climate so change, and, and, helps you better and they speak about broad broad impacts. And gives you um, an idea not not only you not only to health, but geography career, and that's economy, to you. et cetera. We'll be sharing, as I mentioned, today's slide and the recording shortly, and we'll be making the slides and recording more broadly available three months uh, from now. And if you're not already a a member of the Canadian Public Health Association, I would encourage you to join. So it's a great way for um, for you to network with other public health professionals. It also gives you um, free access to these monthly webinars. We have a mentorship program and, and so many more benefits like discounts on our, our conference. So if you're interested in joining, have a look. I'm posting now the link to that section on our website so you can find out more. And I hope you learned as much as I did. We have another one of these in, uh, in about a month. The topic will be on uh, a day in the life of a public health physician. So I encourage you to, to register for that. And again, as a member, you can attend for free. And lastly, if you have a few minutes, it would be great if you can uh, help us improve the, the, the series by completing a quick little survey. And that helps us. Um, this is only the second year that we've had this series. So it's really, really helpful as we, we keep improving. So I mean, I'm seeing lots of uh, uh, thank yous, and as Ali's saying too, you can reach her by email. I'll include that in the, the email that goes out with the uh, recording and the slides. So on that note, thanks for joining us, and we hope to see you next time. <laughs>